Okay, uh, friends, uh, it's Saturday, 8.30 p.m. in Indian Standard Time, and we are, as usual, you know, the present to uh, conduct this webinar. It's a mega webinar series named as the Saturday Manufacturing Talks. This uh, webinar series is getting conducted by uh, the Center of Excellence in Advanced Manufacturing Technology. So, uh, on behalf of this uh, COE AMT at IIT Kharagpur, myself, Sudhir Pal, I'm the chairperson of the Center of Excellence. Uh, I would like to welcome you uh, for your presence, and and uh, it's a it's a wonderful experience that we are having uh, since uh, March 2021. So almost eight plus months we are over uh, in conducting this webinar series. We are fortunate to have speakers from industry, from uh, academia, from you know the within the country and outside the country, different parts of the globe. And uh, so they are sharing their experiences and views on different aspects of the manufacturing. We had seminars on additive manufacturing, robotics, uh, industry 4.0, uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning algorithms, and all. Our center of excellence in advanced manufacturing technology, we work on four uh, thematic areas. One of the four thematic areas is the specialty materials. So, uh, in that domain, uh, Dr. Dipankar Ghosh uh, would be talking about the advanced dielectric materials and its application in manufacturing. We know that, that there is a tremendous potential of dielectric materials there in different uh, the, the domains, uh, in VLSI, in ULSI, and high energy storage, you know, the capacitors and all. So, we are very much eager to hear from uh, Dr. Dipankar Ghosh regarding this, uh, the advanced dielectric materials. What are the developments uh, taken place, and at the same time, uh, you know, what are the applications? And uh, the at the end of the day, we are also exploring that uh, how we can collaborate uh, the together the, the, with the with Dr. Uh, workplace and the Center of Excellence and I, at IIT. Uh, the I'd what? like to formally introduce Dr. Ghosh. Dipankar Ghosh received his B.Tech degree, B.Tech honors uh, in Metallurgical and Materials Engineering Department uh, in, uh, from IIT Kharagpur in 1999. M.S. degree in Material Science and Engineering from University of Cincinnati, USA and Ph.D. degree in Material Science and Engineering from North Carolina State University in USA. He is currently employed as an Advanced Research Specialist in the Corporate Research Laboratory of 3M Company. Uh, in Minnesota since 2006. He currently holds 18 issued US and 39 corresponding international patents and has authored 19 publications in peer reviewed journals and conference proceedings. He is a senior member of IEEE. His current research interests are functional materials and technology applications in electronics and energy area. With this, I would like to request Dr. Gustav uh, take the you know the, the similar format. That goes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so thanks very much for the introduction. Let me share my uh, slides here. Can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, and can you can you hear me? Okay. Yeah, absolutely fine. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for the introduction, and thanks to Professor Paul and also IIT Kharagpur for uh, you know for the kind invitation, and for giving me a platform to talk some of the work that we have been doing here in 3M. So I'm absolutely delighted to be here. This is my alma mater. As Professor Paul said, I graduated from here, uh, uh, you know, 22 years ago. So it's very good to be back here. So I am uh, working in the corporate research lab in 3M company in Minnesota. Uh, and today I'll be talking about dielectric materials, uh, research applications and manufacturing uh, in 3M company. So here's a brief outline of my talk. 
uh, I will introduce you to 3M company for those who are not very familiar uh, with what we do and what we work on. Uh, I'll also give a brief introduction to dielectric materials and applications and why we should uh, consider, uh, you know, why, why they're important. I'll talk about uh, dielectric materials at 3M. So you can consider this talk as specialty materials in manufacturing. So this is a little bit different, uh, more of materials based, uh, but uh, I hope at the end of the talk, you will see that, uh, you know, how uh, materials are uh, useful for real world applications. I'll give you some product examples as well. And then I'll also talk about uh, some of the current research work uh, that I'm working on uh, in, in this area. So uh, here's the, hold on, let me move this away. Okay, let me get the pointer here. So, uh, you know, this is our uh, headquarters here in St. Paul in Minnesota. Uh, we were established in 1902, more than 100 years ago. Uh, last year, we had about uh, $32.1 billion in sales all over the world. R&D is at the heart of what we do, and therefore we devote uh, quite a bit of uh, resources to R&D. So it's about 6% of our sales, $1.8 billion. Our business is divided into four groups. I'll talk about that, that uh, in a little bit more details. Uh, we have more than 90,000 people working for 3MS globally. In India, we are headquartered in Bangalore. As I said, uh, R&D is very important for us and we are a science and technology based company. So patents and intellectual property are very, very important for us. So to give you a perspective, last year we were granted about 500 patents, uh, US based patents. And we are one of the 30 companies that is part of the Dow Jones Industrial Index. So in, in, in short, uh, we are a diversified manufacturing company uh, taking advantage of science and technology to make products for our customers. So uh, we have uh, four business groups uh, in, in 3M. The first one is the safety and industrial group. And, uh, you know, during this COVID times, you have probably seen people wearing 3M N95 mask. Uh, still uh, the gold standard for N95 masks uh, all over the world. And then we have the transportation and the electronics, as the name suggests, they're serving automotive and electronic OEM customers. I will talk about some of the uh, products that we have introduced in the electronics area. Uh, healthcare obviously is very important. And then we have a consumer business group as well. So uh, I'll, to give you a little bit of an idea about uh, R&D in an industrial environment. Uh, so we have an integrated innovation model so what that means is uh, the research and technology most of the time is developed in-house. So we are part of the research lab. Uh, we have a corporate research lab, one of the few uh, manufacturing uh, companies in the US which still has a corporate research lab. And you know we work on various technology platforms. I'll talk about that a little, little bit more. Uh, the D part is the product development part and that happens mostly in the business groups uh, and the business group labs. So as part of the research, because we are a diversified manufacturing company, we make more than 50,000 products every year. Our technology can be broadly divided into this technology platforms. Uh, so this is represented as a periodic table of sorts. If you want to think about it that way. So, you know, this has materials, uh, processing capabilities. Uh, digital is becoming more and more important these days, as we all know, and then also applications. So what has happened over many, many years is that uh, we have been able to introduce successful new product that has been built on uncommon connections. So some of the uh, products and some of the applications that I'm going to talk about today uh, will involve the ones that have been highlighted by Arrow. For example, it will have ceramics, uh, electronic materials, precision coating and web coating, uh, modeling and simulation, and energy components. So, and sometimes you'll find uh, various variations or a combination of each of these technology platforms. So now I'll move on to dielectric materials and why, uh, you know, give you a brief introduction for those who are new. So dielectrics are electrical insulators, meaning they're electrically non-conducting and that can be polarized by an applied electric field. Uh, in some dielectrics, they have, there is already, already a permanent dipole so if you look at the cartoon here on the top right, uh, so you have two charges, a plus Q and a minus Q uh, that is separated by a, a 
finite distance d. When you apply a field, uh, you have uh, your charge polarization, and uh, you know you you have the presence of dipoles. So dipoles essentially they're a pair of equal and uh, opposite charges. They are separated by a small distance. And you, if you look at a basic definition of a dipole moment, it is the product of the charge and the distance between them. And you know, if you look at uh, some common uh, industrial examples of, di of dielectrics, uh, you can think of mica, glass, uh, barium titanate, silicone, which is a polymer, mineral oil, which is a fluid, and many others. So once again, a little bit more of uh, coming to some basic stuff. So relative permittivity uh, that defines uh, is the ratio between the permittivity of the medium epsilon uh, to the permittivity of free space. And this is actually a complex quantity. So it has both a real part, the epsilon prime, and an imaginary part, epsilon double prime. The real part, uh, this determines the amount of electrostatic energy that is stored per unit volume in a material and the epsilon double prime uh, that determines the energy dissipation that's associated with charge polarization. That means it is a loss. So uh, what we do is we quantify many a times uh, this loss as dielectric loss tangent, which is simply a ratio of the epsilon double prime to single prime. And I think it's fair to say that uh, the characteristics of a dielectric material are determined by the relative permittivity values and the dielectric loss tangent values. For example, if we are trying to make a capacitor, what we would like to do is to keep this epsilon prime as high as possible and keep the epsilon double prime as low as possible. So in terms of applications, there are many, I think probably the uh, biggest application is capacitors and energy storage where dielectric materials are the predominant materials that, that are being used. Uh, these days, you know, high speed communication is very important. So we already have 5G introduced in many parts of the world and 6G is not too far away. So RF and uh, microwave communication uses a lot of dielectric materials. Power transmission uh, and power uh, you know, cables use a lot of dielectrics, but there are also other applications, for example, sensors, MEMS devices, uh, PV materials. So I thought that today uh, I'll talk about uh, some of the products uh, in 3M that we make that are based broadly on dielectric materials. So we are not, in a sense, a uh, dielectric based company. We are not a capacitor company. As I said, we, we make, uh, you know, we are a diversified manufacturing company, but many of our products are based on dielectric materials. So first example I'll show you is an embedded capacitor. Uh, we call it electronic capacitor material, ECM. Uh, second, I'll talk about applications of dielectrics and electromagnetic interference or compliance EMI or EMC materials. The third example is uh, high voltage power cable accessories. So in that, uh, you know, we uh, give you some research examples and some product examples for electrical stress control in power transmission, uh, high voltage composites with enhanced breakdown strength. And then we are also active in sensor accessories for the smart grid. So as you know, all over the world, uh, you know, utility companies and uh, infrastructure companies are working to upgrade our electric grid uh, so that it becomes smart. Smart in the sense that it can sense current voltage uh, for grid modernization. So this is an area of active research, but because of lack of time, I won't be able to go into any details. And finally, I'll talk about uh, multi-layer laminates for optical applications. So here's the first example, uh, embedded capacitors. Uh, we call it an electronic capacitor material, in short, ECM. Uh, so first uh, question that you might say is, why do we need embedded capacitors, uh, embedded passives? So passives means capacitors, inductors, and resistors. And the reason is, if you look into a printed circuit board uh, that is ubiquitous in our consumer electronics in your laptops, phones, and tablets, uh, the real estate is shrinking. So as you know, phones and tablets are becoming lighter, smaller. At the same time, they have higher computing power and they also consume higher power. So you don't have a lot of real estate. So what people have been doing for a while now is removing the surface mount capacitors and putting them, embedding them in the printed circuit board. And that is the reason, that is the uh, logic behind uh, behind this embedded passives. So 3M has been making this embedded capacitors for a while, 
and they're being connected to the active device by interconnects or vias. And the advantages is, uh, you know, are quite a few. You can have faster charge delivery. You can have simplified PCB design, uh, lower noise dampening, uh, greater signal to noise ratio. And of course, you have board size reduction, which allows you to miniaturize your uh, circuits and your uh, devices and reduces assembly cost. Now, uh, as I mentioned, the motivation is driven by the electronics industry, uh, you know, following Moore's law. And, uh, you know, we are getting to smaller and smaller devices, which also require uh, greater performance uh, in terms of computing power. And these are used as, you know, power ground, ground inner layer, uh, for example, distributed capacitance, both for rigid and flexible PCBs and also for IC packages. And they can also be used as capacitors for decoupling, uh, filtering, and other applications. So here I show you a SEM cross section of a printed circuit board. This is a printed circuit board layer, and you can see this uh, orange or yellow colored one. This is the embedded uh, 3M capacitor that's, that is embedded inside the PCB. So that's how it is laminated. So I'll talk about uh, how it's manufactured and how it's made because it's a fascinating process. So what we start off is barium titanate and dielectric powders. Uh, barium titanate is a well-known dielectric that has been used in the capacitor industry uh, since World War II. Uh, so we take this uh, barium titanate fillers, micron size powders, and we mix it with epoxy. Uh, plus there are some dispersants and other things uh, that to make a uniform uh, coating. So, and then this is coated on a copper foil that is 35 microns thick. So you can imagine the aluminum foil that some of you use in your kitchen. So you can think of that, it's very thin. And this, uh, you know, the slurry is now coated on this copper foil. And this is done by a web coating. So imagine, so this is how it looks like. So the brown uh, thing here that this is a copper foil, this has been, uh, you know, uh, taken off a little bit to show the dielectric. And the white portion here that you see is the barium titanate in, uh, in in epoxy that has been coated. So we have this copper foils that are, I think about uh, two feet or so in diameter. And uh, the coating is done on a roll to roll basis on hundreds of feet every day. So uh, this is a great example of precision coating uh, that is done on a web-based coating or on a roll to roll uh, coating in which 3M has a lot of expertise. So essentially what we are trying to do is to make a MIM a metal insulator metal capacitor. Uh, so the top electrode is a copper foil, the insulator is a dielectric, and the copper foil makes the bottom electrode. So once the coating is done, we do the lamination and make the MIM capacitor. So, uh, you know, the, as I said, the industry is moving towards uh, higher power devices. So that means we need higher capacitance or higher capacitance density uh, embedded capacitors. So how do we do that? So if you look at the simple equation for capacitor that all of us are familiar with, if you do the math, you will see that the capacitance per unit area is proportional to the dielectric permittivity, the dielectric over here, and inversely proportional to the thickness. So uh, as we increase uh, the capacitance, as we increase the permittivity, uh, we can have a higher capacitance density. As we decrease the thickness, we can also get a higher capacitance density. However, in terms of manufacturing, uh, there are limitations to doing that. So one way to increase the permittivity is to load more and more barium titanate. So that leads to dispersion issues and agglomeration issues. And uh, we can also go uh, to a strategy where we decrease the thickness. But as you can imagine, when you're coating thinner and thinner layers, the chances of having a manufacturing defect also increases. So those are the challenges that we need to overcome uh, to make higher capacitance density capacitors. So I'll show you three products that have been introduced by 3M for many, many years. And there are some links down below. If you click on that, you can get more information. I don't want to go into all the details, but what I'll show you here is three different products that have higher capacitance density. So as we go from left to right, uh, we are going from one nanofarad per centimeter square to 3.1 nanofarad per centimeter square. So 3x times increase in capacitance density. And this has been done by, first of all, increasing the dielectric uh, permittivity value. So we are going from 16 to 22. So 
So that means we are loading more of the barium titanate in the epoxy. And then the other thing that we are doing is uh, decreasing the dielectric thickness of that barium titanate epoxy layer. So you, we are going from 14 microns, which is already pretty thin, to about six microns. So this represents a lot of manufacturing challenges. And because we have a lot of expertise in roll-to-roll -roll coating, we have been able to do that uh, consistently for a very long time. So just a summary of the 3M embedded capacitor technology. So this is used by AA engineers uh, to make a simplified PCB design, uh, facilitate product innovation, and also lower cost. I have talked about advantages. It reduces impedance. Uh, it improves your signal to noise ratio uh, and improves signal integrity. And uh, this has been widely used in telecom, in computer, uh, in military aerospace, medical and consumer electronics. Now, all of us here are using uh, smartphones. And now, I cannot name the brand, but in many cases, uh, the microphone that you are using in your phone, uh, that is powered by a 3M ECM capacitor. So many of us are using this ECM capacitor uh, in our cell phones. So the second topic that I would like to highlight is electromagnetic interference or EMI or electromagnetic compliance EMC materials. And I'll talk about how dielectrics can be used here and why they're important. So EMI, what is EMI? So EMI is basically a disturbance. It's a noise, uh, it is unwanted, uh, that is caused by an external source that affects a circuit uh, because of the unwanted EM waves. So if you look about here, let's say this is an active circuit. Uh, this is a, you know, it could be a, a transmission circuit. It has some antennas. So if you have EM waves, uh, that are unwanted, that are not in the frequency range of interest, that will cause, cause noise in the circuit, and this will drop your signal integrity, and you won't be able to hear your cell phone very well. So this EMI is actually a very significant issue in the industry, and it can affect the performance of many electrical and electronic circuits. As you know, uh, high frequency communication is very, very important these days. We already have 5G being rolled out in many parts of the world, so typically 5G is, uh, we are talking about frequencies from three gigahertz to 40 gigahertz. And then uh, 6G is not too far away, maybe anywhere from five to 10 years away. So 6G is looking at 100 gigahertz and higher. So as you go to higher and higher frequencies, these EMI issues become more and more pronounced. And added to that uh, complexity is the fact that our circuits are being miniaturized every day. So that means the EMI problems are becoming more and more pronounced. So that is why what we need is proper EMI solutions uh, that can improve signal to noise ratio, enable high frequency operation, and also increase antenna performance. So if you look at the cartoon here on the right, uh, so you have the circuit here. Uh, so you have an incident EM wave coming in. And if you have an EMI absorber or a composite right here, you can have three things that can happen. The first thing is you can have EM absorption where the incident EM wave comes in and gets absorbed. It's converted into heat and it is mitigated. The second thing that can happen is the EM wave can be reflected back. And the third thing that can happen is that the EM wave is transmitted. So uh, in EM absorption, what we try to do is we want to absorb this as much as possible and convert that unwanted EM wave into heat. Uh, reflection in some cases is fine, but if you have another circuit over here or another antenna very close to your active circuit, number one, then that performance will also be affected. So reflection is not good in some scenarios, uh, but it is okay in some. But the best case is absorption, where you absorb the EM wave and convert that to heat. So we have been uh, making products in this EMI EMC space uh, for a while. We have a wide suite of products. So if you look into, uh, you know, I have given a, you know, shown pictures here of, of various products that we have. So the first ones is uh, shielding tapes and grounding adhesives and gaskets. So these are the ones that I'm talking about. So these are pretty simple constructions in which you can have a metal foil. Uh, that is, and that is, um, you know, that has a base of uh, adhesive, pressure sensitive adhesive, and a release liner. So you can you can really uh, remove the release liner and put the tape for conducting applications. We also make uh, EMI absorbers. I'll talk a little bit more about that. 
And then we also have flux field directional materials right over here. So these are uh, fascinating materials in the sense that the construction is, is such that it can direct your EM waves into the direction that you want. And these are used for NFC applications when you are doing a payment using your phone. Uh, it uses this, uh, you know, flux field directional materials uh, which have dielectrics. So a little bit more about our absorbers. So as I mentioned, absorbers are uh, they convert the unwanted EM waves that are incoming coming in and convert them to heat. Uh, so here's a 3M example of a 3M absorber. This is you can think of this like an A4 paper sheet. So you know it's like um, 10 inches or 12 inches by maybe 8 inches in in in, uh, in dimensions. So these have a magnetic and in some cases a dielectric filler. Uh, which have high loss values because you want to have the incoming EM wave converted to heat. And the challenge here is to finding the uh, right material because most for most dielectrics and magnetics, uh, the loss values actually goes down with higher frequencies. So when you are looking at materials and the you know 1 to 40 gigahertz or 1 to 100 gigahertz, there are not many materials that are active at those high frequencies. So we have some unique materials. Uh, that we have been able to uh, use them in this high frequency space. So, you know, EMI, of course, uh, you, you, you use it to reduce uh, uh, noise in electronic systems, and it can be applied to noisy traces, uh, integrated circuits, and reflective circuits surfaces in, in, in an enclosure. So, my third example for uh, dielectric materials is high voltage power cable accessories. So, this is for the power industry and very important for all of us because without power, uh, we cannot have a modern civilization. So, what are cable accessories? So, uh, you know, it can broadly be divided into splices and terminations. Uh, so, here I have a cartoon of a person, a field operator, who is actually working on an electric pole. And the one circle here is a termination. So this person is installing this termination uh, on a power cable line. So what is a termination? So termination, as the name suggests, it terminates a power cable line, which means it, it seals the cable end. And then it controls the electrical stress. So I will use this word electrical stress quite a few times now. And what this means is high electrical field. So simply your voltage divided by distance. And this also provides an electrical uh, external insulator. So splices are basically uh, very, very similar to terminations, except that they, instead of terminating one cable, they are joining two cable lines. So very similar in function, and it provides the same kind of insulation, uh, you know, compared to the terminations. So we have been uh, working in this area for this high voltage cable accessories for a long time. So 3M came up uh, with this cold shrink technology uh, that has been used by the power industry uh, many, many years ago. And at that time, it was a revolutionary technology. So you can see some uh, examples of our cold shrink product. So from a manufacturing point of view, this is at that time, it was very revolutionary because what this is, is a silicon elastomer that has already been pre-stretched and this is put on a core. You can see this white thing here. So this core can be, you know, it's like a coil and you can take it out. And if you put it on a joint, because this is already pre-expanded, it will shrink in size and it will, uh, you know, it will assume the exact same dimensions as the joint. So you don't need any heat or any other external energy to fit uh, this connector. So we are familiar with this. We introduced this to the power industry many, many years ago. And what we have done recently is uh, take the solutions that were earlier used in the low to medium voltage installation and now adopted them for use in the high voltage installation. So one thing to note here for, uh, for this power industry is the trend uh, that industry, that power industry and utility companies are moving towards in all over the world is moving to high voltage levels because if you transmit power at high voltage, you have lower transmission loss. So all over the world, you will see that new uh, installations and new infrastructures, uh, they are having high power. So going to 100 kilovolts all the way to uh, 800 kilovolts in some cases. 
So here's an example uh, of a, a power cable accessory that we make. So we call it a 3M cold shrink uh, silicon rubber skirted termination kit. In terms of manufacturing, this is fascinating because you can imagine this is not a simple structure. So you have the silicon on the outside. The, these have the skirts. These have been put to uh, reduce tracking erosion. So to, to improve or expand or enhance the insulation life of the silicon. And this has high K mastic. You have these connectors that go inside. Uh, there are some YouTube videos about how this installation is done. And if you have an extra few minutes, you can watch them. It's, it's really fascinating technology. And this can be used at a high voltage level. Uh, you know, according to IEEE standards, 69 kV is high voltage. And these are lightweight uh, because of the special, uh, you know, the cold shrink technology and the design. And these have safe installation. And this has, uh, when it was introduced, it revolutionized uh, the power industry. So this is an example of a high dielectric constant material. Uh, because the dielectric constant is about 22 at 60 hertz, which is a, a power uh, frequency of operation. That's a normal frequency. And the dissipation factor of the loss is pretty low. It's about 0.1. So you can think of this as an example of a dielectric material that is used in the power industry. Now I'll talk about, uh, so far I've shown you examples of products, but I'll talk about a little bit about research that we do in this area. So the first one is electrical stress control in high voltage cables. Uh, so electric field grading. So why is uh, electrical stress, why is controlling electrical stress important? And why should we be concerned about it? So if you look at this cartoon here, so this is a typical power cable line. So this is your central conductor. Uh, it could be a copper line or, a, uh, you know, or it could be an aluminum alloy of some kind. And you have insulation. Typically, this is silicon on top of it. So once you remove the ins insulation on the conductor, uh, because you want to end the line or you want to join two lines, uh, you have a hell of a problem because now you have this high stress area. So if we don't control the stress, then what will happen is we can have electrical events such as surface corona and partial discharge, and that will like, lead to dielectric breakdown and catastrophic failure. So that's not, you know, nobody wants to stay uh, without power and we cannot allow that. So people have come up with solutions to control this electrical stress in high voltage power cable lines. And one way to do that is capacitive field grading. Uh, what that is is a geometrical grading with appropriate shape of the conductive parts. And the other is the refractive grading with high permittivity materials. So I'll talk about this, uh, about some of the work that we are doing here. And the other way to uh, control this electrical stress is by resistive field grading, uh, where we use the special materials, uh, which has appropriate current applied field characteristics, meaning these are nonlinear, uh, varistor material. Varistor meaning uh, you can change uh, the, the capacitance uh, or the resistance actually with applied field. So a little bit more into this stress control. So once again, if you look at this cartoon on the left, if you don't have uh, field grading, what will happen is your uh, electric potential lines are very close to each other, meaning you have high stress. And if you do the field grading, these lines, uh, you know, they are uh, far apart from each other and it will redistribute it, re redistribute the concentrated lines over the surface away from the high field region. So this is one way to mitigate electrical stress. So essentially what we are doing is improving the insulation resistance and reliability of these high voltage accessories by using this kind of technology. So uh, most of the time uh, what, uh, you know, what utility companies, power utility companies do to control electrical stress is use a stress cone. So this is a geometrical solution, not a material solution. And what this is, is uh, adding more and more capacitance. So what you are doing is adding a cone of insulating material, which has an outer electrical conductive electrode. And by adding more capacitance, what you're doing is redistributing the electric potential. And this helps in stress control. It works well, uh, but the problem is, as you can imagine, when you are adding more and more capacitance, uh, these are heavy and bulky elements that are really difficult to install. So the industry is actually looking for solutions in this area. 
And some companies have come up with dope zinc oxide, various ceramic composites uh, that has been provided as a solution. And uh, we have been active in this area and thinking, are there some other solutions that we can come up in this area as well? So I would like to introduce to some of the new work that we have been doing. So uh, this is calcium copper titanate. It's a ceramic, it's a pseudo perovskite, a non ferroelectric material. Uh, you know, it was discovered some while ago and people reported very, very high permittivity values. So 10 to the power five for single crystals and 10 to the power four for polycrystalline materials at room temperature at low frequencies. So people have, it, have attributed this high permittivity value uh, to a IBLC, internal boundary layer capacitor, uh, where you have a grain of this uh, ceramic, which is semiconducting and a grain boundary that is insulating. And for single crystals, uh, people have attributed the high permittivity values from twinning defects. So, so far, uh, you know, a lot of papers, a lot of ideas, uh, seems like it has a lot of potential, but there has not been any practical applications as of yet. So what we have done is made the CCT in the lab uh, as a material scientist, uh, you know, we uh, want to make things in the lab and look at microstructure and see how microstructure affects the property, the final property of the materials. So we made the CCT powders using a very, uh, very simple technique, you know, calcium carbonate, titanium dioxide, copper oxide, mix it with the solvent, uh, make the slurry and then, uh, you know, calcine them at high temperature and then mix the CCT powders with silicone. Uh, the composites were made using a very simple cast and cure process and test them for dielectric properties. So as material scientists, the first thing we look for is uh, look into the microstructure. So SEM, you can see that pretty big, big grains, uh, rock-like structure, uh, quite a bit of agglomeration. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we also look for XRD structure to make sure that we have a single phase uh, ceramic material. And some of the work that we have done uh, has been published. You will find links below. Uh, feel free to go through them if you're more interested in getting details about the work. So when we test for dielectric properties, first thing we do is to do uh, dielectric permittivity on the, on the y-axis and then loss tangent on the second y-axis versus frequency. So the takeaway message from here is at low frequencies, let's say at 60 Hertz, which is the power frequency, permittivity values are pretty high. It's close to 15 and loss values are pretty low. So these can be used as capacitive grading uh, for uh, you know, electrical stress control because you have high permittivity and low loss. Then uh, the other thing we want to make sure is, is this stable with temperature? So you have permittivity and loss tangent as a function of temperature. You see that there's not much variation. So we are, when we are looking at practical application, going from 50 degrees C to about 200 degrees C, you can see that the lines are pretty straight. So we have stable characteristics, which is very useful for application uh, as a field grading material. So here's the nonlinear part, probably the most important property that we have. So if you look at into current versus voltage, so you can also think of this as conductivity with applied field. Uh, so I have two plots. The orange line here is a silicone or control material. And the blue dotted line is the CCT silicon composite at about 30% loading. So this is under DC applied field. So you can see that with silicon, it's a straight linear line following Ohm's law. For the CCT composite, we see something interesting. So at a threshold voltage, up to this threshold voltage, you have a linear trend. So follow Ohm's law, and then it becomes nonlinear. It means it follows this power law, where you know you have I equals to K V to the power alpha, where alpha is your nonlinear coefficient. So the CCT composite, initially this is an insulator, and after the threshold voltage, it becomes conducting. So this is your typical varistor behavior because CCT has this intrinsic short key barrier at the interface where you have a semiconducting grain and an insulating grain boundary. So you can see that you have five decades of dynamics and current, which means nonlinearity over large current range. And you can also have tunable threshold voltage. What I'm showing you here is 30% loading of CCT in silicone if you have higher then your threshold voltage goes down. If you have lower concentration, then your threshold voltage goes up. And not only we need this uh, nonlinear characteristics with applied field, it has to be reversible. 
because in, in, in when you're looking at real world application, uh, you will have electrical stress uh, being applied again and again. So your uh, device has to work multiple times. So you can see that you can have ramp up, uh, linear, nonlinear, and then ramp down. So there's some hysteresis plot here involved, but you can see that this is a reversible nonlinear property as long as you don't cross the electric breakdown strength. And then what I showed you earlier was under DC conditions, and now I am showing you nonlinear property under AC and impulse conditions. So this is dielectric permittivity with applied field for two different loading levels, 30 volume percent and 40 volume percent. You can see increase in permittivity, uh, which has been calculated from uh, dielectric polarization. Uh, so higher nonlinearity for higher loaded composites. So here we see resistive field grading uh, under AC impulse, and earlier I showed you under DC conditions as well. So uh, here's a brief summary. Uh, so we have developed some new nonlinear composites with CCT varistor ceramics, uh, trying to see how they can be used in uh, this electrical stress control. Uh, I think from a manufacturing point of view, this can be made by molding or extrusion. And I think there's quite a bit of process robustness because uh, the loading levels are pretty low at 30 volume person loading. And the properties of the CCT depends on the intrinsic varistor property and not on uh, percolative property like what you would have if you put some uh, conducting particles in there, for example, such as carbon black. And then in terms of matrix materials, you know, you can think of silicone, EPDM rubber, epoxy gel, grease, etc. So uh, this is, you know, potentially an application for this kind of ceramic, uh, dielectric ceramics, where uh, nonlinear varistor materials can enable new and improved applications in electric field grading and insulation. So the second topic, uh, research topic that I'll talk about is uh, how to improve uh, breakdown strength in silicon composites. So uh, this was joint work that we did with Penn State University and the Center for Dielectrics and Piezoelectrics. It is similar to your Center of Excellence in IIT Kharagpur. Uh, this is a center that is jointly based at Penn State and NC State University. And I was the research, uh, principal research investigator on that program. And our aim was how do we improve the high field properties of silicon rubber for power cable insulation. So if you look at this top right cartoon over here, uh, this is a simplified view of a power cable line. So the central core is a conductor. This is your copper line or your aluminum line that conducts the electricity. And you have many layers of insulation. So in most cases, this insulation is made from silicone. So here's a, you know, we are familiar with silicone. Uh, this is a chemical structure, a classic silicon oxygen bonding. And silicon has been used uh, in the power industry as an insulation material of choice for many, many years because it has very good properties, mechanical properties, processing it's easy, uh, very good insulation, low dielectric loss. But our challenge was, uh, you know, you have this material which already works well. Can you find some fillers and make composites and improve the breakdown strength of this silicon? So this is our aim here, how to achieve high breakdown strength and low loss for the silicon composites. Uh, we are also interested in uh, maintaining that the elastomeric properties of the matrix should be maintained. If you look at some loadings, uh, some fillers where you have high loading, the mechanical properties will change, the elastomeric properties will change, so we don't want that. And then because this was an industry-funded program, uh, we are also, uh, you know, we have to keep a tab on uh, production costs. So the filler should not drastically increase production cost. So what we uh, focused on uh, in this work with Penn State University was clay filler particles. So clay, for those who are not that familiar, these are layered uh, ceramic silicates with plate-like structures uh, that can be exfoliated. Uh, they are low cost, have non-toxic chemistry, and uh, you know they have been used in the industry for a while. Uh, people have reported improved mechanical, electrical, and thermal properties of polymer composites. So as part of this research work, uh, we uh, used two different kinds of clays. Uh, one was a uh, organically modified monporilonite, I would call it OMMT clay. And the second is a vinyl uh, silent treated calcined kaolin clay. So surface treated kaolin clay, T37 clay. 
And the polymer matrix that we chose was a two part liquid silicon rubber, uh, Elastosil um, 3003. And uh, so essentially what we did is make two different kind of composites, the silicon rubber OMMT clay uh, composite and the silicon rubber T37 composite. The other thing to keep in mind is we use this at pretty low loading levels, so about 2.5 volume percent. As I said, uh, you know, we want to maintain the elastomeric properties of the composites and clays have high aspect ratio, meaning the length is much, much higher compared to the width of the clay platelets. So even at 2.5 volume percent, uh, it will affect the properties of your composite. So once again, as material scientists, we look into the microstructure uh, this is the OMMT clay. You can see that these are pretty big agglomerates of the order of five microns. And once we put this clay in the silicon rubber, you can see that we have a pretty rough interface. So uh, not a smooth interface at all, pretty rough. And as in comparison, this is the T37 clay. So this is, uh, you can see that these also have some agglomerates, but, but much smaller in size, uh, less than about one microns. And when you put it in silicon, you'll see a much smoother interface compared to what we have here. So we have quite a bit of data here. And once again, this has been published uh, because of constraint of time, I can't go through all of them. Just I'll show you a few highlights, few interesting uh, things that, we came, that came out of this research. So what we have done here is plotted dielectric displacement as a function of electric field. So you can see that three different composites, the neat silicon rubber uh, in black, the SROMMT in red and the SRT37 composites. So the SROMMT composite shows the highest field tolerance level, the highest breakdown strength. Uh, if you look into the loss value with electric field, uh, you will see that uh, above 30 mega volt per meter field, uh, applied field, the loss values went up considerably. And uh, for the ASR, uh, for the silicon rubber OMM2 composites, the dielectric loss remained pretty relatively lower with increased field. Uh, but both for the silicon rubber and the SRT37 composites, the loss value actually increased quite a bit. Now, uh, people have worked on uh, using this clay field uh, polymer composites for insulation earlier. And if you look into a pure epoxy, so this is the electrode tip. Uh, this is where you are applying a field and what happens is when you just before breakdown, you have this electrical tree that is branching out. So once this tree reaches the other end of your composite, you will have electrical breakdown. So you have electrical current flowing from the tip to the other end of, of the composite. So the way people have uh, explained the use of clays in improving the breakdown strength is because of this clays platelet like structures. So here you see the tip of the electrode and you have this electrical tree coming out. If you have this layered silicates, this platelet like structures, what happens is you have branching out of the electrical tree. And because of this branching out, you have energy being expended, energy being absorbed. And that's why you have high breakdown strength. So we also observe the same here. And people have plotted Weibull plots, which is a plot for reliability in terms of breakdown strength. So this is also from literature, you see polyethylene. Uh, this is neat polyethylene. You can see that the breakdown strength improves, you know, the curve shifts towards the right when you add this clay particles uh, in the polyethylene. So this is in line with what we have found. Uh, but there are some surprises in the research findings, which I will point out. Uh, so here's the summary of this high voltage composites that we, uh, that we made in this collaborative research work. So two different kind of clay composites. Uh, here's the interesting part. So if you uh, recall the microstructure that I showed you earlier, the Kelvin clay was shown to disperse very well in the liquid silicon polymer. But even though typically you think that if something is dispersing well in a, in a matrix, you will have breakdown, higher breakdown strength. But that was not the case here because what we had was a negative surface charge on this Kelvin clay. Uh, which has a which had a detrimental effect on the catalytic activity of the platinum complex uh, in the silicon rubber and led to incomplete cross-linking. And this uh, led to high dielectric loss and high DC conductivity and thereby lower breakdown strength than the silicon rubber itself. 
Whereas for the other clay, the OMMT clay, it was more difficult to disperse in the silicon matrix, but turns out that that actually had higher breakdown strength. And the reason for that uh, was uh, we attributed that to the presence of interfacial traps uh, between these agglomerated macroparticles, uh, which limited the migration of the charge carriers over long distance. So uh, the high level takeaway was the silicon rubber OMMT composite, even though it wasn't, you know, even though it looked like it had rough interfaces and was difficult to disperse, actually had higher breakdown strength compared to the silicon rubber and the silicon rubber T37 composite. So this is my final topic uh, for today, and this is multi-layer laminates for optical applications. So you could say this is uh, tangentially related to dielectric materials. This is more for optical applications, but I think still there's some relevancy here, and this is uh, fascinating from a manufacturing uh, point of view, and I'll point out why. So 3M has been uh, making this uh, multi-layer laminates for optical applications for many, many years now. So essentially when I say multi-layer, what this is, is multiple layers of high refractive index and low refractive index materials that are all put together. So this allows you to be wavelength selective. You can choose the refractive index you want, or you can do some intelligent design where you can choose a wavelength uh, or a wavelength of interest. And this is actually inspired by nature. So if you look at the colorful wings of a butterfly, uh, so they also employ the same strategy. So they have this multi-layered uh, high and low refractive index, which gives rise to this beautiful colors that we see in some butterflies. And this is actually work done by Mike Weber. Uh, he's a corporate scientist in 3M. And uh, you know this was a fascinating work done and uh, he published this work in science in the journal science uh, many uh, some some years ago many years ago so as i said this is fascinating from a uh, from a manufacturing point of view because uh, if you look at this construction what this is is you have this hundreds of layers and each individual layer is very very thin it's about 100 nanometers so the way this processing is done is you can have three different polymers uh, which are co-extruded and as they are coming out they are being stretched so when you stretch uh, you know in different directions uh, you can have refractive index development and film orientation and that gives rise to the high and low refractive index that gives rise to this optical phenomena so uh, there are very few companies that can do this kind of manufacturing on a roll-to-roll -roll basis and 3m has been leading in this area for a long time now so in terms of new functionalities that are enabled by this uh, multi-layered film optics. So one is you can have mirrors without a metal. So imagine uh, you can have very, very high reflective surface up to 99.5%. Some of the highest efficiency mirrors that are known in the industry. So these uh, films can give you this kind of mirrors. Uh, you can have color uh, without use of any colorants or dyes. Uh, you can have polarization without absorption. Some of this is used in uh, privacy films and in, in, in laptops where only the person sitting in front of the laptop can see what's on the screen. Somebody sitting on your side or either side is not able to see what's on your screen. So acts as a great anti-privacy, uh, you know, a privacy kind of filter for uh, industrial applications. And then uh, finally, you can have light without heat. So this is used in solar films to redirect the films away, to re redirect the heat away from your car. Uh, you know, very applicable, I guess, to cars in India where summers can get very hot and also in buildings, both at home and in office. So this is my last slide here. So I think the takeaway message that I'm going to leave with you is, uh, you know, even though we are not a dielectric based company, there's many interesting dielectric related technology that are hidden in 3M products. So you might be using them, but it's very difficult to know that there's some dielectric related technology behind them. And the key to leading performance is because of novel manufacturing technology and unique structures. So I think those are the two keys. So, uh, so obviously you can see this is a large volume of work. Uh, this is based on teamwork, uh, thanks to my 3M collaborators and colleagues. I've worked with them for a very long time. 
And thank you very much for your time and attention on a Saturday morning and a Saturday evening. Uh, with that, here's my email. Uh, if you have any follow up questions, I can answer them now. Later on, feel free to contact me. Happy to answer any questions that you might have that you might have. So thanks so much. Yeah, thank you, uh, Dr. Gross, for wonderful, uh, you know, the the presentation of your research work. I must say that you are doing good in excellent research in at 3 a.m. Uh, you know, from the manufacturing uh, perspective, uh, since I'm a manufacturing man, uh, so I do have some questions. Uh, so you mentioned about the dielectric fluid, uh, dielectric material of uh, very uh, fine thickness, like the six micron and all. So if, uh, when you go for this coating, uh, you know, how do you check the quality? How do you ensure the quality? I, I mean, the coating is uniform. Yeah, so, you know, uh, in the, that, that's a great question. So this is not just being made in the lab. This is made for, for uh, you know, for the industry. And so we use, so for thickness, we have very tight control. Uh, you know, it's used, uh, we use ellipsometry. And then uh, we also do high potential testing to make sure that it meets the voltage. So one way of indirectly knowing that we have the right thickness is uh, to know that the voltage at which this will work. So let's say for six volt, uh, you know, the the breakdown strength will be 50 volts. So we apply that voltage and make sure that it is passing. That's the kind of quality control that we do. Is there any scanning method that, to ensure the uniform uniformity in the thickness across the uh, the area? Right. So, so yeah, obviously they, they do, you know, ellipsometry and that kind of uh, thickness uh, measurement kind of characterization. Uh, but uh, I think the one that they do more frequently is a voltage testing. But yeah, ellips ellipsometry is also done to make sure that we have the right thickness. But the voltage uh, measurement, uh, does it not give you the, the average uh, of the area and all? Because uh, in for a particular localized zone, if I would like to measure that how much is the the, the, the thickness. Yes, it is. Uh, but, you know, uh, we have been doing this for uh, many, many years, I think, uh, because this is actually micro printing, so, or coating. So, uh, you know, there's some manufacturing uh, tricks there uh, that I cannot go into too much detail. So, obviously, they have a very tight tolerance on the thickness, because as you mentioned, this is really, really thin, and we need to make sure uh, that uh, we meet the customer requirements for voltage and thickness for this kind of uh, capacitance. There are, uh, there might be some questions in the chat uh, box. Let me see. Yeah, Dr. Dev Gupta has mentioned, appreciated your talk. Uh, yeah. Can you, can you see the questions at your end? Uh, just a minute here. Let me. I. Hold on. Yeah, I cannot. Yeah, I say, uh, I mean, uh, so Dr. Debuta wants to talk to you offline. Uh, and discuss this. Uh, sure, I can. Yeah, I can. I can do that. Yeah, if you, if you can kindly uh, tell me the questions, uh, I can, I can. Yeah, so the next one is, uh, I can see one more question yeah. from Mr. Somnath Sengupta. So, for EMI applications, do you do any kind of uh, S parameter measurements in RF? Yeah, yes, absolutely. So, uh, you know, the, the values that I, I didn't show you any values here, but uh, for uh, this high frequency applications, uh, we uh, you know, there's no, the way we measure the permittivity and the loss values and for magnetic materials, the permeability and the loss values are from S parameters. So yes, we use a standard, uh, you know, network analyzers and we use our algorithms to, uh, you know, get the, the S parameters are given by the instrument and we use our modeling to uh, to find the dielectric constant and the magnetic uh, permeability values from those S parameters. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, uh, there is a question from uh, Mr. Ananta Datta. So thank you for the interesting talk. A few questions is that, is there any alternative 
process, example, tape casting or applying such a thin layer, six micron or directly material onto the copper coil. Uh, so, is... you know, you, uh, if you, if we look into this uh, embedded capacitor technology, uh, so everything that we know in the market, so we have uh, some competitors from Japan and also from US. So they also uses use uh, this thin film technology. Actually, you, you can call it thick film technology. It's not quite thin film. Uh, so, uh, so embedded capacitors is a way to go because people have been using the surface mount capacitors for a while now. But as I explained, uh, what is happening is that your circuits are shrinking in size and there is no more real estate here for passive devices. So you can have only, there's only area or space for active devices because devices are shrinking in size. So these have to be removed and the only way forward is embedding them in the printed circuit board. Yes, but one more question is that there is a density difference between kaolin clay particles and silicon and rubber. So how to ensure the homogeneous distribution of the clay particle within the metal? Yeah, let me go to that slide here. Yeah, so, so for the OMMT clay, you know, because of the agglomerates, we saw a rough interface. So we couldn't uh, do, uh, because of the agglomerated structure, we couldn't ensure a smooth interface. For example, when we had the T37 uh, clay, the Kaolin clay, as you can see that it had a smooth interface. But, you know, as I said, the surprising thing is uh, from a microstructure point of view, just looking at this picture, one would think that because this is a smooth interface, you will have a uh, higher breakdown strength. But what we found was the other way around. We have this agglomerated particles in silicon uh, with a rough interface, but that still uh, had a higher breakdown strength. So that was a surprising result that came out from this research work. Yeah, so there is a question from Mr. Sengupta that uh, follow on about S parameter. I wanted to know if you did S11 measurements to determine how much energy is being reflected. And if so, what is your requirements of for amount of energy that has to be reflected to make it a good protection material? Okay, so great question. Uh, so, you know, for a good observer, uh, let me go back to that slide. Yes, so for a good absorber, uh, you know, typically what we, the way we quantify that is dB, right? So power uh, 10 times log of power in, power out. So we want, so for mo most uh, civilian applications, uh, you know, we, we want to have at least 10 dB. That means you want to have at least 90% absorption. So these days we make some products which are much better than that for some military applications or some uh, stealth applications, you can actually have 20 dB. That means 99% power absorption, 1% reflection. So I would say in general for, uh, let's say consumer electronics or civilian applications, uh, you need something uh, between 10 to 20 dB of uh, absorption uh, or power attenuation at a certain frequency. So this is also frequency, frequency dependence. So to answer your question in short, you, you need at least 90% absorption. Uh, that is uh, applicable for most consumer electronics. Uh, the better, uh, the higher, the better, of course. And we, we have been able to make uh, in some frequencies absorbers that can absorb 99% of power. Professor Alok Kantivide has mentioned, what could be the optimization challenges in embedded capacitor design? Um, uh, quite a few actually. So what what happens is, as I said, uh, so first thing that our uh, customers look for is higher and higher capacitance for unit area. So currently our, let me, so currently our highest rated or highest value product is 3.1 nanofarad per centimeter square. Uh, this is one of the highest in the industry. Uh, so higher the value, the better, because it allows you miniaturization, but that is not the only thing. Uh, so, you know, you can have, for example, I haven't put it here, 
but for example, the TCC values, uh, the lower, the better, uh, you know, that's what some I don't know what this is. So the lower, uh, the better in some cases. Uh, so for example, you know, I haven't put the values for thermal conductivity. So thermal conductivity is also very important. So those are things that could be uh, optimized. And then, uh, you know, I think I had mentioned about, uh, you know, improvement in uh, EMI. So that is also something depending on the capacitance, the size that can be improved. So to answer in short, uh, it's not just the primary metric is uh, capacitance density, but you can also think of thermal conductivity. Uh, you can think of temperature coefficient of capacitance, uh, the size of the capacitors, the thickness, all that plays a role uh, in reducing noise, in uh, reducing EMI uh, for the circuit of interest. So those, all of those could be optimized. Yeah, we are running short of time. So we'll just close up with uh, the one question because everybody talks about AIML at the end of the day these days. So uh, the question from Omkar is that, is it, is it if possible, is there any scope for AIML based inspection in embedded PCB, PCB circuit board? Uh, there embedded should be, I, 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 yeah, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm not aware of any study, but you know, these days AI and ML is uh, becoming more and more important. So I think, you know, I'm yet to see that kind of data, but I'm sure, uh, you know, that is some kind of work that can be done with the customers where they provide us data. For example, let's say this EMI noise, when you're putting in this uh, PCB, when, when you're putting embedding this ECM in PCBs, so what kind of EMI noise do we see? So uh, I think, uh, depending on their feedback, uh, we could have large amount of data where now we can go back and optimize our thickness, our thermal conductivity, our TCC values, and, uh, you know, have reduced the EMI for customers. So that's a good question. I think there's a scope for AI and ML uh, in, in fact, for any of the topics that I discussed today. Uh, I haven't seen that, but I think that's a topic for uh, future research. Good. Yeah. Thank you uh, so much, Dr. Ghosh, for your insightful lecture. Uh, I think uh, I'm pretty sure the audience uh, have enjoyed thoroughly. And uh, so we do, you know, the shortage of time, we will not place all the questions over here. But uh, you have shared your email ID. And uh, uh, if anyone has got any questions, so they can uh, directly contact uh, Dr. Ghosh and get the questions clarified. So, Dr. Ghosh, okay. thank you once again for your presence, for accepting our invitations to give a, a wonderful lecture. Uh, I request Ananta to let us know about the, the speakers for the next uh, few weeks. Ananta, can you just let yes. us know? Yes. Yeah, Dr. Ghosh, thank you once again. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yeah, so for the next week would be our speaker would be Mr. Arjun Malhotra. So Mr. Malhotra would be talking about the scope and opportunities for entrepreneurship in product design and manufacturing. The upcoming webinars in the month of November, uh, we have got scheduled with uh, additive manufacturing and smart manufacturing. It will be talked be discussed by Dr. N. C. Murmu from CMERI Durgapur. CMERI is the Central Mechanical Engineering Research Institute, is the CSL lab. The next two, uh, next week, that is the, on November 13th, uh, John Norris, Professor Norris from the University of Olong. So he'll be talking about the recent advances in gas metal, gas shielded metal uh, arc -linking. And on number 20, the Girish Shodhari on the robotics and artificial intelligence from University of Illinois, Urbana Sampan. Then George Van Der Boot would be talk, uh, talking about the metallographic practices in welding on number 27. 
our all uh, you know the webinars are getting recorded and it is placed in the google drive so if you want to uh, listen to the past webinars webinars then you can scan this uh, code and get to see that thank you so